Hi guys, I'm back um, for a little bit more about food systems. Um, we already recorded a lecture um, called Food Systems Part 1, and this one will be shorter. Thank goodness, the other one was a little wordy. Um, but it talks a little bit about kind of the future of what our food systems may look like in the future. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. And here we go. Okay, let me actually go back to the beginning where I want to start. Okay, so um, as we've already said, we have this very complex international globalized food system. Um, and unfortunately, it requires lots of inputs, which require energy, which create pollution, which have degraded soils over time. And so we're kind of looking to think about how we can continue to feed this enormous number of people that we have on our planet. But we're trying to think about what can we do to change our food system to kind of focus on um, the future, make it kind of a viable system in the future. So um, we're going to address a few issues. First of all, GMOs, which we did talk about a little bit in class the other day, but I'll just kind of revamp for some of the folks who weren't there. Um, then other technologies, um, organic foods, and other potential kind of regenerative farming methods. So first of all, um, I think a lot of people have heard of what sometimes we call GMOs or genetically modified organisms. These are sometimes also called transgenic um, organisms. And basically these are foods that have been um, altered or their gene, their genetic coding, their DNA has been altered in kind of a laboratory setting in order for them to grow in a different way than they would without that alteration. So of course, we have intentionally altered the genetic coding of the crops and the domesticated animals that we have um, intentionally for many thousands of years. That's what domesticated crops and animals are. Um, but we've done that through crop breeding in the past, right? We've selected one particular organism, one particular potato and bred it with another potato or one particular cow and bred it with another cow, hoping that the offspring of those two organisms would have similar traits to the desirable traits that we had in their parents. Um, and then in that way, we have certainly manipulated the genetics of organisms in a very substantial way over time, right? You just can see a chihuahua and a wolf and tell that there's been a lot of genetic manipulation that has happened there. However, um, in the past, that genetic manipulation has not been through actually kind of going in in a laboratory setting and intentionally cutting and splicing together genes in the DNA. Um, and that's what we have done in the last couple decades through genetic modification. So this is a new technology. There's different ways that it can be done. CRISPR technology is one of the kind of um, newer, more modern things that you hear a lot about. And there's some different ways, but basically we use um, like bacteria and viruses to actually um, kind of cut the DNA of an organism and then they splice, they put other kind of um, desirable coding um, into the DNA chain. And then that changes the way that the DNA is expressed, the way that the organism grows, and it can make that organism taller or shorter or greener or more purple or whatever um, and that's kind of the concept okay so that's what a genetically modified organism is um, genetically modified organisms are grown widely in the u.s about 50 percent of ag land in the u.s is in different kinds of gmo crops um, it has increased um, rapidly um, in the last couple decades since this technology um, came about in the 90s um, it's not something that's grown in other parts of the world. So for instance, the European Union has banned um, genetically modified foods. They feel like the jury is still out on kind of the long-term safety um, of these foods. There has been a lot of research about um, genetically modified foods in the US and there is not conclusive evidence that specifically being genetically modified makes a particular organism dangerous. Um, and we'll talk more about some of the conflicts about GMO, GMOs in a minute, but that's kind of what we have found so far. However, of course, our data um, is limited in time, um, and there's some other issues that we'll talk about. 
Um, and again, theoretically, this is a technology that could allow us to make um, plants more drought tolerant, for instance, or things that might be desirable in a changing climate. Um, however, so far, the two main technologies that have been widely kind of rolled out in genetically modified organisms are two things. One is called HT organisms. So there's a whole set of um, organisms, different kinds of soybeans, cotton, corn, for instance, that are HT, which means that they are herbicide resistant. So you can spray a particular herbicide that's called glyphosate, which you've probably heard of as Roundup. Um, you can spray this on the crops. They will kill competing weeds, but it won't kill the crops because the crops have been genetically modified to be unaffected by this herbicide. So you can use this herbicide to compete or to basically make the, the crop that you're trying to grow, the Roundup ready, quote unquote, crop ready. Um, and then you don't have to do as much tilling to remove weeds and you just don't have as much weed competition. So this is a widely um, used genetic technology. Then the other main technology that has been rolled out is something that's called BT. So in this case, um, genes from a soil bacteria that were found to be toxic to beetles, butterflies, and moths has been inserted into the genetic coding of certain kinds of plants like corn and cotton. And so now when these uh, butterflies, beetles, moths eat the um, cotton or corn, they die. And so they're not eating the crop. And in this way, the farmers that use these particular kinds of BT products don't need to do kind of air aerosol like from a plane or from a pump spraying of pesticides to get rid of certain kinds of bees and butterflies that might be decimating their crops. Um, now, of course, there's many other kinds of bees and butterflies that might be having beneficial impacts to their crops that might also get kind of caught in the crossfire here, um, but we'll talk about that more later. So anyway, one um, common argument for GMOs is that it's a technology that will allow us to really um, feed the future of the planet, grow plants that are more drought resistant, um, more able to survive in a changing climate. And unfortunately, this is just not really the technology that has been ruled out so far, which doesn't mean to say it couldn't be, but it's not really what we're seeing on the market so far. So um, there is a limited number of plants that um, are being grown that are GMO so far. So they do, they are grown in a large area. Um, and actually this is a list from 2016. I was looking around briefly this morning and I couldn't really find a more up-to-date list. So this might be a few years out of date, but basically there's several different kinds of corn, cotton, tomato, soy, canola, potatoes, um, sugar beet, and then a few other things, but most of the fruits and vegetables that you buy at the grocery store are not genetically modified. Even most of like the sweet corn that you would buy to eat straight up is not genetically modified. So a lot of this genetic modified food is going into um, more processed foods or is going into animal feed. So when you're eating cow, it was likely fed GM corn and GM soy. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Um, but anyway, um, a lot of things at the supermarket might be labeled, you know, GMO free. And that's likely because there's no chance that they could be genetically modified because there's no genetically modified organisms that are for sale that are on the market that could be grown. Um, and of course, it might just also be because that company kind of supports the concept of genetically um, modified free foods. And so they want to kind of uh, support that market even if there's not a possible way that they could be growing a genetic mod modified organism in that particular product. So of course there's a lot of current controversy about how safe GMOs are. Um, and um, as I said, so far it doesn't seem like there's research to support the idea that just purely by being a genetically modified organism you are inherently unsafe as a food product. And um, that's not something that sh is shown in the research. However, um, I, I'm gonna talk about the cons first on the right. Um, there are certainly people that are concerned just with the kind of philosophy of 
genetic modify, uh, modification. They feel like we are kind of messing with nature in a way that might come back to bite us. Um, and they're kind of uncomfortable with the use of this technology. Another concern is that so far genetically modified foods haven't been labeled in the US. It's not required that if you use genetically modified foods in your food products that you have to label them. And so what a lot of um, scientists and consumers have said is, well, how do we know that these foods are safe if we can't do any long-term research on um, you know, who's eating what because we don't know what is in which food products. And so there's actually gonna be a change so by 2022, genetically modified foods will have to be labeled in their products. Um, and that will not be true for animal products that have been fed um, genetically modified foods. So if it's like a kind of one step removed, it won't be labeled. But if you were buying, for instance, like corn chips that had genetically modified corn in them, that product would have to be labeled. So that might help us kind of understand any potential impacts of these foods in the future. Um, some of the concerns that have come about with these foods is that um, many of these kinds of products, as I said, that have come on the market um, are able to grow well with the use of things like glyphosate. Um, so if we're widely spraying Roundup on plants, then that can help this particular crop. However, of course, that encourages the use, widespread use of glyphosate. Um, which is a pesticide which could have some impacts on insect populations both for beneficial insect populations and then potentially um, impacts on you know other organisms that are eating insects or even all the way up to kind of a human level when humans have high exposure or consistent exposure such as like agricultural workers um, so that's a particular concern um, Sorry, glyphosate is an herbicide. Did I just say it was a pesticide? Anyway, there's concern about consistent exposure of this chemical um, to organisms and people in the environment. Then these Bt organisms, um, as we said, have kind of internally a pesticide element in them. And so they're um, detrimental to moths, um, butterflies, and beetles. And some of those moths, butterflies, and beetles can really decimate crops. Um, and so that's why this is a technology that has been rolled out. However, there's lots of important um, butterflies, moths, um, beetles that act as important pollinator species. And so we may be unintentionally killing a lot of pests, um, pests or insects that really aren't pests that are beneficial insects and then ultimately kind of undermining the sustainability of our agricultural ecosystems. And then as we've already talked about before, there's the ability to kind of um, potentially end up getting either weeds or insects that have grown resistant to the use um, of these kind of BT organisms or the spray of glyphosate. And so then ultimately um, our mission to try to kill these particular pests or weeds is undermined by the consistent use of the very thing that we're trying to use to kill them. So that's a concern. Also, um, again, so far, a lot of the BT crops that have been sold and are being grown on the market are kind of high responder crops. So they can be successful, but they do require a um, considerable amount of water and fertilizer. Um, and so those are resources that we may want to use less of in the future. And maybe there will be genetically modified organisms available that won't be high responders, but so far we have not seen those available. And then um, another concern that a lot of people have is kind of about the ethical and kind of business and social impacts of genetically modified foods. So in a somewhat controversial decision by the Supreme Court um, a couple decades ago, these genes that these big ag companies, things like Monsanto, develop um, can actually be patented. And so that was a very controversial idea because right, genes are living organisms and can you patent, can you own the right to, to life of some particular gene? Um, and the Supreme Court in this case said yes, if you have developed that gene um, in a lab, um, and so now we have large amounts of the seed that's 
used for different kinds of agricultural crops owned by a very small number of companies. And so this has really limited access and made a lot of the seed very expensive. And so this has raised some issues about kind of food security issues. And then a lot of times you'll hear about the idea that there's this thing that's sometimes called terminator technology, um, which is the idea that um, certain genetically modified organisms um, have can have a built-in gene which causes the seeds that grow on that plant to be infertile. So you have a tomato, you grow it, the tomato makes seeds, but that seed in the tomato could not grow into a new tomato, which would then force growers to buy new seeds every single year. And so that's good for the companies that are patenting these genes, but that's not really good for farmers who in the past were able to kind of store their own seeds from year to year. And so legally, this is a required, if you buy genetically modified seeds, you are not allowed to collect the seeds and regrow the seeds every year. You are required to rebuy them from year to year. That's kind of part of your license for using the seeds. And the Terminator technology does exist. Um, Monsanto did not develop, but they bought this technology. So they do have some plants um, that are able to grow and have seeds that are not viable. However, they don't actually sell the seeds um, on the market because that was a very controversial kind of food security issue. So they do require farmers to sell, to buy seeds, new seeds every year. They do own this technology, but it's not something that they sell. So anyway, that's some uh, clarification of something you might've heard about. So anyway, those are some cons. Um, on the other side, um, there's some potential um, improvements that could be made through this kind of technology. Um, so one um, reason that people have praised um, certain GMOs is that um, because they have rolled out this HT um, series of plants, this glyphosate herbicide resistant series of plants, We've seen a transition in the United States away from some more toxic um, herbicides that were used in the past, things like 4,2-D that were even more toxic. And so we have a more pervasive use of Roundup instead of some other herbicides. Now glyphosate likely still has some health issues. So I feel like that's a little bit of a mixed bag, but that is something that we have seen. Um, we've also seen a, a reduction in kind of aerial pesticide spraying um, because of the technology development of the BT organisms, the organisms that have that systemic, that internal pesticide. Um, however, of course, if that internal pesticide set of BT plants is grown widely, there's still a lot of exposure of insects to um, a pesticide, which may have detrimental impacts. Um, certain plants have been genetically modified to have higher vitamin content. So some of the rice um, has been um, able to do that. And then another thing is that if we're using herbicide to kill off weeds, that is able to reduce the number of times that we have to plow up the soil. And as we're increasingly understanding, plowing the soil is very damaging to soil organisms and can lead to soil erosion. And so if we're able to use a lot of glyphosate to kill off plants, we may actually be able to protect our soil resources better than we have been um, in conventional agriculture over the past um, half century. So um, that's uh, kind of potential wins um, from GMO so far. And then again, as I said, there's a lot of talk about how GMOs could potentially in the future develop plants with higher yield. So like more wheat seeds per wheat plant or more corn ears or corn kernels per corn plant or that might be drought tolerant, or that might be able to be adapted to different kinds of climate changes in a rapidly changing climate. However, again, those are not the technologies that are on the market so far. So that's maybe a potential um, benefit for the future, but not something that we can kind of measurably um, see has occurred so far. So this is a controversial issue. Um, in my personal opinion, as, it, as I already said, I, I don't think that there's something inherently about a genetically modified organism that makes it dangerous. Um, there are some people that do think that, that are scientists that are worried about the way that we use bacteria and viruses to change genes and think that that might be unstable and that we can 
kind of set off a cascade of other changes that might be undesirable. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, but I'm not particularly concerned about that. However, I do feel like the very, very wide scale use of HT and BT crops is something that's not um, sustainable for our agricultural ecosystems. And I do have concern about the wide use of those particular products. Um, okay, so another kind of um, potential future route for food would be kind of a more organic food route. And so um, organic is a word that people throw around a lot and they can use it in different ways. We've used it in here to describe things that are associated with living organisms. Um, organic in the food movement is a particular certification that you get um, from an agency. And so there's different levels of organic, like you can be California certified organic, which is, has a different set of specifications than being certified as USDA, federally organic. Um, so to be federally organic, you need to be grown, growing food in soil that has not been sprayed with certain kinds of um, prohibited substances, which are most synthetic and chemical, synthetic fertilizers and chemical pesticides for at least three years. So it's a, something that would take a transition time. You can't grow genetically modified organisms. Um, if you're growing organic animals and animal products, you can use no hormones or antibiotics on your animals. You have to feed the animals 100% organic feed and forage. So you can't feed them GMO corn or corn that's been grown um, with synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. Um, and you need to give them a certain amount of space. And I'm not gonna get into all the details of that, but that's kind of the animal things. And then if you have products, um, like a granola bar that's organic, it would be um, required that it uses no artificial colors or flavors, so no kind of chemically produced um, materials that don't actually grow from animals. So like you can use honey, but you can't use some sort of chemi chemically created sweetener um, or preservatives, and then you need to have all organic products inside. So um, that's kind of what the organic move food movement is all about. Um, and it's something that's been increasing um, widely in its distribution and its sales in the U.S. And again, this is a graph that's a little bit out of date, but I couldn't find a uh, really much better looking, uh, more modern one. And I think this certainly illustrates the trend um, to us. Um, and basically, this is the idea that um, more and more farmland is, in the U.S. is being converted to um, converting its acreage um, to organic. So in millions of acres that has been increasing since the 90s. The number of farms that are certified operations has been increasing steadily since the 90s. And then the sale of these organic products has been consistently increasing since the 1990s. Um, and all these um, trends are continuing today. So for people that are concerned about the use of synthetic fertilizers, which are very energy intensive to produce and can create water pollution problems, um, and are concerned about wide pesticide use, this is a way to go. Now, of course, um, it usually costs more to buy um, the organic products, so that is certainly a concern for a lot of people. Um, but a lot of people nonetheless have continued to kind of increase um, their consumption of these different kinds of organic products. Um, and anyway, you can kind of see this trend. Um, this is a big, big um, continued market share. And as we kind of talked about in the last lecture, um, there's ways that you can kind of go through and maybe pick certain kinds of organic products um, that you think are most important to be organic while you don't buy other things um, that are organic if you don't feel like you can buy all of them. So, you know, there's ways to pick and choose, but there's certainly information out there about um, which products that are organic might be significantly different, produced in a very, very different way than their non-organic counterparts, whereas other um, plants may be a little bit more similar um, just because the conventional way that they're grown maybe doesn't use as many toxic chemicals. So one of the kind of questions is, you know, is it possible that organic agriculture can produce a 
decent yield, enough yield to actually compete with conventional ag agriculture on a large scale to feed the over 7 billion people that we have on the planet. So a lot of people at first kind of said, you know, this is like maybe a niche thing that can feed a few people, but this isn't really a way that we can feed the world. Um, and, there, and there has been um, a lot of studies that have tried to look at this. Um, one study that I was reading is what's called a meta-analysis. So it's like a study of studies. So it looked at 192 other studies that compared yields in conventional and organic systems. And it found that um, organic production was a little bit lower, about 19% less than conventional products. And again, that's comparing um, kind of monoculture systems. So we do find that usually in polyculture systems where we're growing multiple plants side by side, um, that we can get yields for each plant a little bit higher. Um, another really long-term study, which is kind of one of the most famous and most cited studies, is a 33-year study, so the longest study that we have in the United States comparing organic and conventional agriculture, is something that was done by the Rodale Institute, um, which is on the East Coast. And they have a over 30-year study comparing these two techniques. And what they found is that they are actually able to have comparable yields over the long term. So maybe in the first few years transitioning to organic, certain farms would find a drop in yield. But over time, as their soil improved um, and their insect communities improved, they would actually find comparable yields. And they would do that with a lower energy input. So that's good for the planet and good for their pocketbook. They would do that um, by producing fewer greenhouse gases. So good for the planet. And they would, in all cases, this is true of the Berkeley studies too, make more profit growing organically. And that's because, of course, they charge a little bit more for organic food. So um, anyway, this is kind of potentially promising um that this could be a way that we could farm in the future and then hopefully like with all things as potentially we started to do this on a wider scale the prices would come down and so it wouldn't be something that would be as inaccessible um, to other people um so not all um farming now um, it, or obviously not all farming is organic, but there are so many people that are interested in sustainable farming that may not be certified organic at this point. So there's kind of a, a side by side movement that's con, called the regenerative farming movement. And many people that are interested in regenerative farming do grow organically, but some are not certified organic growers. But regenerative farming more broadly means that you are farming um, in a way that has a couple different goals. And the two most important goals would be you are managing for soil health. So you're trying to limit the way that you're plowing up the soil that might be killing different kinds of soil organisms that might be leading to erosion runoff of soil from the landscape and into rivers. Um, then you're also growing your crops in a diverse system. So instead of just having, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres of soybeans all together, we would be growing a mix of different plants side by side, which might make the planting and harvesting a little bit more complex, but is going to support a healthier soil biology, and then also hopefully allow you to just get more total yield out of the landscape because the different plants would be, you know, um, coming to fruition at slightly different times. So, you know, while the wheat is blooming, um, the soybeans are getting hold and so on and so forth. Um, so even though your yield of like, for instance, wheat might be slightly lower if you're growing wheat next to corn, your total yield is going to be higher in many of these systems. Um, and then as we also said, um, if you have just kind of a diverse system of organisms, that's more um, mimics a natural ecosystem. So you're going to have more diversity of um, insects, soil um, organisms that are going to help plants grow. And then also, you're probably less likely to need widespread things like pesticides because um, if you have many different plants growing side by side, there's probably not one pest that's going to be able to get in and decimate um, this diverse ecosystem as well as it could if everything was the same and that it was just a complete feeding frenzy for these pests. So that's kind of the idea of regenerative farming. Oh, I thought I had some more pictures in here, which I guess I don't. 
Um, but anyway, th there's a, a lot of movement around this. Um, and hopefully this is a kind of thing that we're going to see a lot more in the future because the sustainability of our food system depends on it. Okay, thanks.